Father, he loves you. He was thinking about you back on that cross. His love was reaching forward to tonight. Thank you, God, for your love. Thank you for your mercy, God, for your grace. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I am so thankful for redemption tonight. You can be seated. Thankful for God's grace that I continue to see working. It was awesome once again. I was uh, had the opportunity this morning to take uh, Ben's friend and co-worker Isaac home. And uh, actually, I, I, I took two Isaacs home today, and so that was a first for me. And uh, But I'll give you a testimony from both of them. First of them for Brother uh, Asher, Isaac Asher, that I, uh, I'd asked him. He had been, he told me a little over a month ago, he was dealing with some ongoing uh, kidney-related pain right over his kidneys. And, uh, of course, he's a doctor, and so the fact that he wasn't able to quite figure out what was going on was, I think, a little bit troubling for him. And so, anyway, he was... Um, he was, you know, we had we talked about it and uh, several times, and after a couple of weeks, things hadn't improved. So I, I I prayed for him in that in one of the services, and then I kind of forgot about it. And I just thought as we we're driving home today, it's like, oh, uh, Asher, how you how you doing with your that pain you were having over your kidney? He says, oh, he says you, you prayed for me and the pain went away. And it's like, well, you could have told me, man. That's great. I mean, hallelujah. <laughs> It's hard to give God the glory when you don't know the miracles happen. But anyway, so that that's great. But then after I dropped him off, it was just me and uh, and Ben's friend Isaac, and so I was getting to know him a little bit. And and so he uh, he had told me that you know he was he planned on being out again next Sunday. And he says, and I and I'm working on getting a car. And he says, and once I once I get a car, he says, you'll see me all the time. And so it's it's great to see the the hunger and desire in these young people right now. And, and I'm really, really thankful for that. And, and obviously, Everett, and Everett was, I can't remember if it was my wife or Pastor Craig that told me this afternoon that, you know, Everett, Everett was apologizing. He was going to be tied up with family things on Easter and wasn't going to be at church. You know, he's only been coming for a few weeks, but already there's that, you know, just that sense that I want to be in church. And that is, it's so fantastic to see high school kids that have a hunger for God. Amen. And so it's a, it's a great season to be a part of the church, and I'm thankful to be together with you all here tonight. Good to see you in God's house. Good to see Jen. Glad that you're feeling better and back with us tonight. Amen. Good to see my brother Josh tonight. God bless you, my friend. Amen. Good to see Joey and Mackenzie tonight as well. Always glad to have them here. And then we have... Two Perry Turcots here tonight. Now, I don't even know if that is legal to have two Perry Turcots in one room, but fortunately, uh, the, the junior is a little milder than the senior. So, anyway, it's good to see uh, Perry squared here tonight. Amen. Amen. And I'll give you a few quick announcements, and then we are going to going to move along in our service here tonight. But I do want, to, uh, first of all, I, I want to give God glory on Wednesday morning this week. We've been, uh, I've been uh, several times, I've mentioned you about this situation we're having with Enbridge to where we're being we're kind of getting a secondary bill to where they're kind of revising back over since October of last year. And the long and short of it is the, the bill of what they're, they're increasing over what we've been paying every month is, was nearly $6,000. So, I mean, it was a, a massive, basically impossible amount for us to have used. And so I, I've been working on... I, I had our equipment all inspected. Everything was fine there. And, and then I had, I had had a 30-day freeze where I went to Measurement Canada, which is an agency that will come and actually inspect meters when there's something that seems to be out of the way. But it, the problem is, of course, as with all things with government, it's, it's actually getting them to, to follow through. And so uh, we were, our 30 days were up. So I had to tell Sister Colleen, well, you know, we don't want to incur more fees. We're going to have to just pay the bill. And so... Um, Neither one of us were very happy about that. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so we, we prayed about that on Wednesday morning. And I actually brought that, that bill, and, and, and I, we, we set it out, and I, I referred to the fact that when Hezekiah was faced with a letter from the Assyrians that essentially was speaking of their annihilation 
that, and it was full of threats and all of these things. And Hezekiah himself, the king of, it, of Judah, was overwhelmed, but he laid that out before God. And essentially his, his prayer was around the, uh, the effect that I can't do anything about this, God, but you can. And it's also the understanding that if we are God's people and he's our protector, God, this isn't my problem, it's your problem. And, and so we prayed the same kind of prayer over that, that bill. And, uh, and so within less than 24 hours later, I had finally a call from the, the inspector from Measurement Canada. And we talked extensively. And Lord willing, sometime this week, he's going to be here to do that. So I, first of all, we do have an answer to prayer. Things finally moving in the right direction. But I want you to pray with me that we're going to see every bit of that money come back to us and, and that God's going to help us. That's money I want to put into the parking lot, not <laughs> up in smoke, literally. And so anyway, so uh, just continue to pray with us about that. Uh, also, uh, Tuesday night, we will be doing our, our next lesson in our prayer series. We're going to be talking about spiritual warfare and how that is waged through prayer. It's a really important uh, lesson. I want to encourage you to be with us here on Tuesday night. Of course, our prayer meetings, I want to continue to emphasize those. So Wednesday morning, 7 to 8, we have prayer meeting on Saturday morning from 9 to 10. And then, of course, prayer meeting before our services. And thanks to all of you who are getting here early and making it a point to be in the prayer room. I appreciate that. And we are seeing a difference from that. And then, of course, next Sunday is Easter Sunday. Again, I want to challenge everybody, if you haven't already, invite at least four people to church. At least somebody will say yes, and if you'll do that, this place will be packed on Easter Sunday, and God's going to do awesome things. We're very excited about that. We'll be having just the Sunday morning service, so get here for Sunday morning. Also remember that we will be taking up a Save Our Children offering for children's ministry, so a special offering towards that. On April the 13th, is Justin and Mandy's wedding right here at noon. We're excited for them. And then on April the 14th will be our services. It'll also be the next time that we are meeting in Renfrew. And uh, keep praying for Renfrew. God is doing great things there, and I'm really excited. We are starting to see a breakthrough. And again, this morning, we had a, a, a man here that, our, his first contact, at least with us, and he's, he's known Perry for a bit, but his first contact with us was in Renfrew at our last service there. So great to see him here as well. So exciting to see those things happen. And tonight's service really is kind of an extension of something that I feel has been a really important part of our our services in Renfrew. And, and very early on, as I was kind of praying about what I wanted to see happen, you know, you have a chance to, when you're starting from scratch, you have a chance to kind of reinvent what it is you want to do. And I just, I felt impressed in that setting that a, an important component of this in the early stages was going to be some testimonies of, and not just a testimony of, you know, of some, I don't want to say minor thing, but rather a a life kind of testimony about who we were before God and what God has done in our lives. And we have heard some, some really amazing testimonies uh, every, every month that we have met there in Renfrew. And uh, Josh is actually our first one of that. And we have heard along the way from some others. We heard from Frederick. We have heard from Nick. We've heard from Joe. And then this last time we heard from, from Justin. And in every one of those testimonies, I have just sat there amazed at, at my God and what he does and uh, the testimonies that are all amongst us. And I, I have felt that I wanted to spend a little time with some of those in uh, in this church as well, because these are people that you go to church with all the time, and many times, because we don't know everybody's life story, we don't know the fullness of what God has done in their lives. And and so I asked uh, after uh, when I when I wanted to start this, I asked Joe several weeks ago if he would be willing to to come and to share with us. And so he's going to come here tonight. And after that, we are going to respond to what we hear tonight. And I'll, I'll come back and I'll give us some direction. But I want us to understand as we hear what God has done in Joe's life, and he has an amazing testimony of, the, of where he was and what God has brought him from. But to recognize that there are who knows how many other soldiers like Joe that are in this, this base, that are stationed here right now, and they may not be at the stage he is tonight, very obviously, but they're at a place where God's reaching to them. And so I wanted to inspire us as we come to pray here tonight and let us to have a burden and an understanding of just what our God's capable of. 
what he's capable of, and what he will continue to do in lives. Brother Joe, thank you so much for being willing to share here tonight. Amen. And we're looking forward to hearing what you have for us tonight. God bless you. Well, it's, it's an honor to be asked to come up and speak. Uh, I don't know how much of a story I have for you, but I'm going to start right at the beginning. Can, can you guys hear me pretty good? Or? Okay. Um, I grew up, uh, was born in 68, and I grew up in a poor family, um, a dysfunctional family. And a poor family. My mom and dad were both alcoholics. Um, when I was young, we moved into uh, Ottawa housing, which is like the projects in the city. It, it was a great place. Like, it was a great place to grow up in because we had about 120, 124 units that had families that had four or five kids. And so there was always always something to do, whether it was sports or hanging out or playing games. There was tons of kids uh, to play with and have fun with. But my home life uh, was a little different because I had a, uh, initially when we moved in, uh, we were a family, my mom, my dad, my siblings. But about four years, five years into it, um, they separated. And it was hard on me. It was probably hard on all of my siblings. I'm not going to take any of that away from them. Uh, because I was a mama's boy. I latched on to, from the time I was young, to my mom. And when the divorce happened, my mom was the one that left. Which at that time, when you think about it, back in the 70s, uh, was very rare for the father to take the children, most of the children, the, the youngest sibling stayed with my mom, uh, and raised them. He was a truck driver by trade. Um, he was employed when he could be employed, but he drank a lot. So for the first six years of my family being together, what I recall, because I was such a young child at the time, uh, was the house environment wasn't the best. There was arguing, there was fighting, physical fights, which I didn't really understand uh, as a young sibling. Uh, and my older brother and my older sister would kind of corral us and, and, and do their best to keep us away from all of the nonsense that kind of went on in, in the house. So, growing up uh, with just my father when my mom had left, I, I found it difficult because... I really, really was uh, attached to my mom. So I felt like I, she had abandoned us, and she had. Uh, and it's unfortunate because it's not uncommon. My story is not a, an uncommon story. Um, so I made do with what I had. And what I had left was a father who drank all the time. So I didn't understand him. I didn't really get to know him because, like most alcoholics, you have two personalities. You have dad when he's sober, and then you have dad when he's drunk. And when dad was drinking, and that was most of the time, you wouldn't tolerate anybody, wouldn't tolerate any of the kids, and it was hard to uh, approach him, it was hard to communicate with him, and... That's just kind of the nature of growing up in my family. So what I did was I did everything I could to get out of the house and enjoy my friends and enjoy being outside and not in the house at all, if I could. I would, and it was a different time back then too, where kids would go out and play and they'd be gone all day. And I enjoyed that. You know, it's, it's sometimes I would get... Uh, so coming back into the house late at night, my father asked him where I was all day and had I even eaten. Uh, but that was just the times we would go out and we would bike and we would go look for bottles and, and pick up bottles in the creek and bring them back to the store and get our nickel for it and, you know, and build forts and, and just get out adventuring. 
So it wasn't uncommon for, for kids at that time. And I think it was great for me because I really, really didn't want to be in that environment. So that's what I did. I spent a lot of time, and I wouldn't trade. I wouldn't trade uh, growing up. A lot of people say, well, you know, how rough was it and how hard was it to grow up in the projects? I don't think that it was rough at all. I, I, I think it, there's a lot of life lessons growing up in that environment. Um, although it was hard at times, I, I really, truly wouldn't trade it. And, uh, and I enjoyed it. I really did enjoy my childhood and, and the things that I did with all of my friends. Um, having said that, <laughs> then you start to grow up and become a teenager. And with that comes, with like, with most teenagers, is fitting in and trying to fit in with uh, different people in different crowds and then your first drink of alcohol. And so I remember the first time I had drank and it wasn't a lot, but it was definitely something that affected my personality and I would say that I quite enjoyed it. It kind of brought me out of my shell because I always was a shy kid, even though I, I liked to get out and, and had a lot of friends. I was never really vocal. Um, and it was a, probably a little withdrawn and, and quiet. But alcohol introduced something totally different to my life that I had never experienced before. And that was the ability to get out and maybe be a little bit crazier than um, I normally would be. Uh, speak a little bit more of my mind, um, and then maybe even take risks and do things that I probably shouldn't have done. It didn't get that bad, and I thank God for that. And when I look back, um, I truly believe that God was watching over me, like he watches over everybody. I truly believe that it could have been worse, a heck of a lot worse, but he got me through it. So right around the time that I started drinking and maybe getting myself into some trouble, I decided at the age of 18 that I was going to, my brother had already joined the military. He had joined the service and he was gone and he was sending postcards back from all around the world. And so he was traveling and doing all these things and I thought, wow, I would really like to start doing that. Get out of here, get away from all of this, and travel. So that's what I did. I joined, I joined the service in summer of 88, figuring I was going to be one of the softer, maybe weaker soldiers. Uh, again, maybe not fitting in. Um... But it was the opposite of that for me. I found the military to be kind of an extension of a dysfunctional family <laughs> when I joined them. And I fit right in. <laughs> they didn't discourage drinking. They actually encouraged drinking. And that was at the time when most of the NCOs and officers of the day were pretty much drunks themselves. So I fit right in. And then, of course, with that comes, well, if it's acceptable, I'm going to drink more. And I always thank God, too, that when I was younger, I tried, like most um, kids do, and maybe early, early teens, um, tried smoking cigarettes. And I tried that for a little bit, but it made me sick. And I thank God that it made me sick because alcohol was my thing, but it could have been worse. All the kids in my neighborhood were doing hashish and marijuana. And then as we got older, it started getting worse where cocaine was on the scene and a lot of acid was on the scene. But I stayed away from all that stuff. And, you know, maybe alcohol was my thing and, and, and uh, maybe that was good enough at the time. 
and uh, it got me through certain things. I don't blame, and, and the one thing I'll take away from my childhood, um, and the one thing I never do and I've never done is I've never blamed my parents for anything. I don't blame my situation, I don't blame my problems on people from the past. I take it. It's my problem, and I live with it, and I work through it, and tried to work through it. I tried to work through it with alcohol, and things started to snowball. I was a, like my father, I was a, a working drunk. I, I never missed work. I never missed a day of work in the military. I never showed up late. Um, there was probably times, and I know there was times, where I showed up drunk, but I was there, and I was on time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that might have been the norm for a lot of us. And I know a lot of the, the officers and NCOs showed up drunk because they weren't around long uh, first thing in the morning when we went for our morning runs and did our morning PT. But I never, to this day, and, and, and I don't rely on that maybe as a crutch, I don't blame my father, I don't blame my mother. As, as much as I wish I had a childhood that was a little bit more functional, um, I quite enjoyed uh, where I was raised and, and, and growing up in that environment. It taught me a lot. It, it, it's... it's when you take the parents out of the, of the picture, and I'm not saying I raised myself, and that's not the case, and, and I'm not saying that my dad was a horrible guy. He was a great guy, and I love him to death. Uh, he had taken the situation that was given to him, and he did his best. I, rem I remember a time, I, I, I don't know, I might have been eight years old, nine years old, and... Uh, he was at his wit's end, and he, had, he was going to give us up. He called uh, Children's Aid, and he explained to them on the phone to come and get him. I didn't know as a young kid what that meant. I knew that we weren't going to be together. I don't even know if I told my wife this. But we all gathered together as siblings, waiting. waiting for them to come and get us. And then something spoke to my dad. And he changed his mind. And I believe that was God. And from that day forward, he raised us, he took care of us, and, and most importantly, he kept us together. Because I don't know where I would be. I, you know, it could have been better. It could have been worse. I don't know. I'm not going to get into that. But I'm just so grateful that whatever it was that changed his mind that day, and he had a little bit of an argument because they actually did want to take us when they did arrive, and he convinced them otherwise. And I'm so grateful to God for that. But I never blamed him for anything, and I won't. So... Fast forward now uh, to the military, joining the military and being in that environment. I fit right in. I truly did. I, I, I was a fighter. Uh, I could take care of myself. Um, the only problem with that is it, it would spill over sometimes into my weekends and, and, and um, nights going out to bars and hanging out with some of the other army guys. And I would get myself into trouble. And I would get arrested, thrown in jail, and I would have the, what we call the sheriff, the military police, uh, the head military police guy come and get me in the morning out of cells. And of course, then you, 
you had the dreaded go see the regimental sergeant major uh, the next morning. And that, that really sobered you up because I was more afraid of him than I was of the police and, and all the other stuff that came with it. But it started to affect, because uh, right around the time I had joined the military, um, my wife had joined me in, in London, Ontario, when uh, we were posted there. And uh, we had a beautiful daughter, Kayla. And we were, I was trying to start a family. Uh, but I was very selfish in my drinking. Very selfish. And then some of the drinking that I was doing was affecting my job in a way that it didn't affect my daily routine. But they, it got to the point in the mid-90s where they said they'd had enough of my antics. And I agreed with them. And I had tried to quit drinking on several occasions over the years. I tried on my own, figured I could do it, figured I could get away with it, and, and it would work. But I don't know that I ever truly wanted to stop drinking. And, and I think that's the issue. And I don't, I don't, I'm not an addictions guy. I don't understand it. But in my case, I truly, I think at the time, didn't want to quit drinking for whatever reason. <clears throat> But it starts to catch up with you. You can convince yourself that you're going to get away with it, that maybe you can do it for a lifetime, but it's going to catch up to you. And it caught up to me. And I'd gotten to an altercation. I don't remember which one it was, but it doesn't really matter. And work at the time said, you know what, I, th I think we're done with you. Um, I think we're going to part our ways. We're going to release you because we've had enough and we don't see this thing going anywhere, anywhere positive. So it hits you. You're going to be out of a job. I've got a young family, very selfish. I'm very selfish and I've always been selfish. Um, and I needed to change something. So on one of my last court cases, part of the deal was my lawyer had said, you know, it's, it would probably be good if you tried some kind of alcohol um, addiction counseling. So I agreed, and I think I agreed at the time, again, young and, and selfish, and I think at the time I agreed maybe to get out of what was coming because they wanted to throw me in jail for seven months. And I thought it was a little harsh, but the reality kind of hits you. It's like <laughs> seven months in jail because when, when my lawyer had said seven months, I thought it was probation. I said, okay, that's fine. And he's like, no, Mr. Melbourne, we're talking seven months incarceration. And I said, whoa. No, I don't think I want any of that. <clears throat> I've got a family. I've got kids. But then it starts to hit you. It's like, well, what do I do to get out of this? And, and people that have addictions, I think it's a constant bickering. I know for me it was, is what do I do to get myself out of this situation so I can go back to where I was? And maybe that's back to drinking again. So one of the things I agreed to was an in-house, I think it was a two-week, I might be wrong, it might have been longer, um, treatment center for, for alcoholics and for addiction. There was other people in there for drugs and things. This was all military personnel. So I did that. I went in there. I didn't really go along with the program. I might have for a couple of things. Um, and then come out of that figuring, you know what, I've, I've got this thing. And I probably went eight, nine months. That was it. And then I was back to drinking again. So throughout all of this, like I said earlier, I, I think I was, God was watching over me. Because there's some things that I had done. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that I didn't hurt somebody or kill somebody. And I'm grateful the same thing didn't happen to me, that I didn't get hurt or killed myself. 
It's a little crazy, it, with the things you do when you're drinking or you're high, I guess. I, I don't know that side of it, but when you're drinking, y- you can be invincible or think you're invincible and do some pretty stupid things. <clears throat> So, after that eight months period was over and I started drinking again, I figured, you know, I've got this. I can just drink a little bit. Convince myself. I can just drink a little bit. I don't have to be drinking all the time. And I never really drank all the time. I didn't drink every day. But when I was a young soldier, I remember starting out drinking on a Friday and then waking up on Sunday. Waking up on Sunday or coming to on Sunday not even knowing if I had eaten. I know I drank, (laughs) but not even sure if I actually ate or ate properly that whole weekend with the shakes. And that routine went on for years. What a horrible, horrible way to live. It really is. So I'm going to tell you my story of how I kind of came here. Tracy, when we were in London, she would go to church. There's a church there. I don't know the name of it, but she would, someone from the church would come and get her every once in a while. Uh, United Pentecostal Church, I believe, right, in in London. And I would do my thing. And then we got posted to Petawawa. And Tracy started to attend church here, and that was good for her and the kids, but that wasn't my thing. Pastor Kingsley would show up Sunday mornings and pick them up, bring them to church, and I'd go do my thing. I would probably either sleep because I was hungover, or I'd go golfing. And I remember one time, (laughs) Pastor Kingsley saying to me, he said, you know what? We, we're doing this all wrong. He says, I'm the one that should be going golfing, and you, sh- you should be taking your kids to church and your wife. Do you remember saying that? <laughs> yeah, and how true that is. <laughs> I don't know if he would have enjoyed golfing. You golfer? <laughs> Brother Kingsley's the best at everything. He would have been the best at everything. He was a general. Would have been a general. Made a great, great general. So I, we had a function up on the base. And uh, so I went and started drinking, socializing. Um, and my thing when I would get myself in trouble was I could drink beer, but I really couldn't handle liquor. So what would happen is I would drink beer, but then that would switch to liquor. And then I wasn't myself. Uh, and that's where I got myself into a lot of trouble. But on this particular night, it was a function up there, and, and I think we went till about 2 or 3 in the morning. Drinking everything. And I remember, or sorry, remember kind of waking up the next day, still drunk. And um, they, we, had, we had discussed the night before that we weren't going to be coming into work and everybody was fine with that. It should have been a work day, but all the drunks convinced themselves that we would, <laughs> we would have the day off. So we were fine there. <laughs> It works. All you got to do is get them all together. All the senior command was there, and we said, listen, you know what, we're, we're definitely not making it to work. It's still th- it's 3 o'clock in the morning, and we're loaded. So I suffered from that night. And I almost prayed for death. And... I know I was at my wit's end. And it's like, why am I doing this to myself? Why am I doing this to my family? We all deserve better. 
So I think this probably the day after might have been the the day after. I, I don't recall it 100%, but I told my wife that I wanted to go to church. Her response at the time was, well, there is no church today. <clears throat> I said, yeah. I said, but I'm going. I, I really need to get to church. So she made some phone calls. We had church that day. I dragged myself in here. I left it all at the altar. I prayed, and I didn't know how to pray. I cried. I asked for forgiveness. I asked for help. And God gave me those things that day. He really did. I was speaking in tongues. And it was as if the weight of the Empire State Building was lifted off my shoulders. I had never, I had never been so free. I had never felt so loved. And it was just a joy in my heart, kind of a releasing of a lot of it. Because I, my whole life, I, I had, not that I had emulated, but I, I, I thought the way my father raised me was the way I should raise my kids. And I wasn't as harsh on my kids as my dad was on me, not even close. But I still was hard. I had a hard heart. Uh, I won't get back the time that I'd lost with my family. I did the best I could at the time, the situation and the drinking. But that day, when I was freed and released, I was a new man, a new man. Isn't God amazing? How he can just take, and, and, and by no means am I the worst, but by no means am I, you know, the, the best father and husband and person, but he does miracles. And I, I used to, when I, when I would come to the church and drop the kids off and I, I would chat or talk with people in the church, I just, I found you guys a little peculiar. <laughs> I really did. I, I was like, there's no way, there's no way that these people could be that happy. Like, how can these people get up every morning and be that happy? Do they not have problems? Am I the only one that has these problems? And the thing is, you've all got the same issues I have. You're no better than me. You're no worse than me. <laughs> you really aren't. And now I'm one of the crazies. One of the things I say when, when, when a newcomer comes and, and they're in my section of the seating is I'll pop up and say, hey, have you ever been to United Pentecost Church? And if they say no, I said, hang on to your seats. <laughs> it's going to get a little crazy in here. But that's, that's what I thought. I thought it's a little over the top maybe. They're, they're, they can't be this happy. But what I didn't have that they had was I didn't have God in my life. I never in, I don't know what it was, 30 years, we weren't raised in the church. My mom's dad had a bit of a background, and my dad was, if, if I'll say anything, he had Christian values. He was a little hard, but fair, but 
he believed in God. But we didn't go to church. We didn't do those things. And so when I was introduced to this church, I thought, wow, if I could be that happy, if I could have that joy that they have. And then I come to learn of the backgrounds of some of the personnel in the church. And I realized, you know what? They're just like me. But they're approaching life differently with God in their life. And I said to myself, I want that. So when I come to church and I got the Holy Ghost and and spoke in tongues, I remember when it was all said and done and and we were talking afterwards, I I said to to pastor, I said, okay, so so what are we going to do about the drinking? And he said, it's, it's done. And I didn't quite understand. I said, well, what do you mean it's done? He said, it's done. And just like that, God had taken the desire and the urge for me to drink. I've never been drunk since. I've never touched it. It's been... I don't know what it's been. I think it's been 15, maybe 16 years. And that's 15, 16 years of being sober, uh, not being as selfish. There's times I'm still selfish, but (laughs) everybody is (laughs) to some some degree, to some degree. (laughs) But I, I, you know, I, when pastor had asked me if I would come and speak and I, and I get a little nervous maybe, um, and then the one thing I've always, I've kind of always said to myself, and, and maybe, it, maybe it's that I didn't deserve it. Let someone else have God. There's worse people than me. Let him fix those guys. And um, although I was selfish, I would, that part of it I would give to everybody else but myself. I never, I, I didn't want it, didn't feel like I deserved it. Felt that it was that bad and that horrible that God didn't want anything to do with me. What a way to think. You know, what a horrible way to think. And we have a God that is able. And I'm a living witness to it. And I thank God every day that I get up that he walks and he talks with me. I can call on him in need. He's there and he will never abandon me. So I hope this kind of helps somebody. It gives you a little bit of background of where I'm coming from. Um, Well, that's all I've got, really. Now you know what I'm talking about when you hear just, and there, there's a thread that I have heard in every one of these testimonies from these people sharing their lives, and that is that even in a time where they didn't know God, God knew them. And they can look back now and see there was moments that God's hand was there protecting them, guiding them, just nudging them. And they weren't ready yet, but God was already working. And by the time that, you know, that I come onto the scene, that I become aware, God's already been working for a long, long time. And so that is what gives me hope right now because I don't know what I don't know. Who knows how many other, like Joe, like others in this room right now, God's dealing with their heart, and they are this close to making that step where they're going to open up and give their lives to God, and God's going to set them free forever. And so tonight, what I want us to do is, is in response to this, is if you'll stand with me, we're going to come and we're going to pray here tonight. And so there, there's a few things that can happen as a response to this. In some cases, God may be dealing with your life right now. This is a testimony that will inspire you, that God can make a change in your life just like he made in Brother Joe's life. And if that is you tonight, when you come to pray, I want you to come with the kind of faith to know that the same God that delivered this man tonight, he can deliver you as well. 
But also, I want you, if, if you're not in that category, tonight I want you to join with me in praying for the other people, the other men and women in our community, young people right now that are bound, that feel hopeless. It's not an unusual thing in almost all of these testimonies. There has been a point where every person has said, I wanted to die. I didn't want to go on. But in that moment, they found the grace where God kept them for just a little bit longer and kept them moving forward. And, of course, we know the end of the story for their lives, but there's a lot of people in our community right now, be it in Petawawa or Pembroke, surrounding areas, where they may be right at that lowest ebb to where they don't want to wake up tomorrow. They don't want to continue on with life. But there is a God who knows them, who loves them, who is reaching right now. And our prayers can be that bridge, that catalyst. I don't know who all was praying for Joe in that, that lowest moment where he didn't want to go on. I know that his family was praying for him and others of us who cared for him. But tonight you can be that person praying for someone. You may not even know their name, but God knows right now who needs that. And tonight when we pray, it's not this kind of prayer in a hopeless vacuum just saying, oh, the world is so full of suffering. It's so full of hurt. Yes, that's true. But there's a greater truth, and that is that even in the midst of that suffering, there's a God who loves people and a God who is able to set them free. And just as he set Joe free, he's able to set them free. So will you come and join me in prayer tonight? Let's reach out to God and let's allow God to speak through us. Let's allow God to work in our hearts. This is a church that prays, and I believe that God is going to give us many more testimonies of lives transformed and lives delivered. And those testimonies are being formed right now as we pray that God is working and he is going to set the captive free. In Jesus' name.
sobre 